there's a standoff in southern Philippines, security forces versus Muslim fighters seeking an independent state. But there's rival separatists too, holding their own talks with the government. So with different groups and different agendas, is peace even possible? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. The conflict in southern Philippines is one of those true ebb and flow battles. Quiet for periods of time, then spikes of violence. But the underlying problems are always there. Right now, we've got a major spike. Thousands of people trapped, civilians being held hostage, even reports of them being used as human shields. Soldiers are battling fighters from the separatist rebel group, the MNLF, the Moro National Liberation Front a group which isn't happy with a proposed government peace deal with a rival rebel faction. So unhappy, in fact, it says it would violate the terms of its own peace deal agreed way back in 1996. And so we've ended up with fighting again. MNLF fighters poured into six coastal communities of Zamboanga on Mindanao Island on Monday. It's a port city of nearly a million people, the main commercial, educational and government centre of the south. And crucially, a largely Muslim region in a predominantly Catholic nation. Now, an army spokesman says the fighters had planned to march in and hoist their flag above the city hall, but they got wind of it. Government forces then surrounded the rebels, and gun battles have been taking place ever since, resulting in casualties on both sides. On top of that, more than 10,000 people have crammed into the city's sports stadium, seeking safety from the fighting. So we've got actually two issues here, an acute situation involving fighting and hostage taking, but also the long-standing situation which has given rise to it. A discussion in a moment after this report filed for Inside Story by Jamila Alandogan in Zamboanga. Since clashes began early Monday morning, up to now there seems to be no signs of slowing down in the fighting between the Philippine government and Moro National Liberation Front fighters. The city of Zamboanga here in southern Philippines remain on lockdown. Over 100 civilians still held hostage by MNLF fighters in several villages here. We've spoken to human rights observers who have said that this situation is becoming increasingly a humanitarian concern. There are families trapped where the fighting is concentrated and they are unable to get food and aid. It's unknown exactly what the situation is like for them over there. Now, the Philippine government now puts the number of evacuees at 12,000. There are those who are living in the streets. There's barely anything to eat and anything to drink. They don't know when they'll be able to go back home. Now, the MNLF started the Muslim rebellion in the 1960s. They were able to sign a peace agreement with the Philippine government in 1996, but this was never fully implemented. Now they are opposing an ongoing peace talks of the Philippine government with another breakaway group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They said that these talks are in fact not inclusive and does not represent the needs of the Moro people of the southern Philippines. We've spoken to Professor Nur Miswari, the founder of the MNLF, a few months ago. He said that no matter what kind of peace agreement the Philippine government will have with any breakaway Islamic faction here in southern Philippines, this will not mean that peace will finally be here in Mindanao. Jamal Alindogan for Inside Story in Zamboanga City, southern Philippines. I'd like to introduce our two guests for today. Now, joining us via Skype from Cotabato on Mindanao Island is Zenudin Malang. He's the executive director of the Mindanao Human Rights Action Center. And then in the Philippine capital, Manila, we've got Stephen Rood. He's the Asia Foundation's representative for the Philippines and Pacific Island nations. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Before we get going, I think it would actually be good, and this is more for our viewers, obviously, um, to make some distinctions in these Philippine conflicts because there are obviously different rebel groups involved, some which our viewers will have heard of others they have and some which can be easily confused as well so I just want to quickly do that MNLF is where we start uh, that is the Moro National Liberation Front as the name suge suggests uh, it sees its campaign as a nationalist struggle Been fighting since the late 1960s for the independence of what it calls Bangasmoro land which includes Mindanao and other islands in the Sulu archipelago you've got the groups then which have split from the MNLF ones which stress the element of religion 
uh, in their separatist message. MILF, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which you've probably heard of, uh, has fought a violent campaign in Basilan. There's Abu Sayyaf, another armed group, another offshoot of the MILF. Actually, it's on the U.S. list of designated foreign terrorist organizations, as it happens. Uh, as is the new People's Army, the armed wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines, whose insurgency has involved kidnapping and extortion. So I just wanted to start with that to lay out all these groups here so our viewers know exactly who we're talking about. Really, we're focusing on MNLF. So I'd like to start with you, Zainuddin Malang, and talk about this situation which is happening right now. How do you actually believe this can be uh, resolved with minimum loss of life and with maybe both sides actually getting some sort of guarantees or some sort of movement out of it? Well, our, thank you, Come on. Uh, good evening to your viewers. Um, our main concern right now is exactly to protect the civilians caught in the crossfire. Um, the crisis has started um, early dawn of Monday, and uh, as of now, there are now 14,000 civilians uh, that are that have been displaced mm. by the uh, skirmishes between the government forces and the MNLF. Um, the entire city, a city of almost one million, is practically in shutdown at the moment. Uh, people's lives have been uh, disrupted uh, dramatically. The question now is, your question is, how do we bring about a situation where people can go back to their normal lives? Um, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, it's going to take a lot of trust between the two parties at the moment. A trust which is made more difficult by the fact that for the past two days, for the past three days, there's been a ex heavy exchange of gunfire on both sides, uh, also resulting in casualties on both sides. And, and for a standing down, uh, arrangement for the two sides to come about, you need trust. And as of mm. now, that trust is the most difficult element in resolving or diffusing this situation. Stephen, Our latest. Uh, oh, well, let me Go just ahead. interrupt Sorry. you just quickly. Stephen Wood, let me get a quick early thought from you as well on your thing. I think that the, the key word which Zainid has mentioned there, and he mentioned it a few times, is trust. There isn't enough here, is there, to for this to be resolved in, a, in an orderly and uh, kind fashion where people aren't put at more risk? That's, that's true. The uh, real problem here is that the elements of the MNLF, not the entire Moral National Liberation Front, but those who are associated with its founding chairman, Nur Miswari, they feel that over the past few years they've been pushed further and further out of the mainstream, further and further out of the peace process. And so it's hard to think of how they would be willing to listen. And in fact, They've been calling for international intervention because they say that this has gone beyond a domestic issue. Mm. And so they take the complete other tack of this situation we have with hostages and, and, and the knock-on effect as well. As, as Zenadine was saying, the whole place is shut down. It's basically choked off the, the economic and social life there. Surely that's not the way to go about it either. Well, it's difficult to understand exactly how this got started. The uh, story that they are there for a peaceful march uh, is of course belied by the fact that they were so fully armed but also because so many of its top commanders are part of this movement that it seems unlikely that they were just going to try to give peaceful demonstrations mm. which they have been doing in other parts of the island but beyond that it's hard to understand what they're trying to accomplish. Zainuddin, what do you think about that? How do you think this got started and, and the, the tactics which they're using? You've described the end game of what's happening at the moment. People stuck in a sports stadium, a whole city, you know, cut off economically and socially. What's that achieving? Uh, I completely agree with Steve on this one. Um, look, this is supposed to be a group that advocates, that espouses nationalist aspirations for a minority ethnic group, the Bangsamoros. And mm. yet, if you look at the demographics, of the civilians, ordinary folk that have been affected, that have been displaced by this latest initiative on their part, the majority of the affected uh, civilians uh, are, are Moros, Bangsa Moros. So, mm. uh, uh, unfortunately, whatever their goal was in this latest effort or action or initiative on their part, they may have unwittingly or unintentionally driven a wedge between them and uh, a huge sector of the constituency that they're supposed to be, whose rights they're supposed to be espousing or fighting for. 
Just for our viewers who are new to this sort of story, is this typical sort of behavior from a group like MNLF? People always go back to what happened in 2001. They, uh, um, a similar incident happened also in the same city, in Zamboanga City, um, where civilians were taken into custody uh, uh, involuntarily. Um, and, and that incident is still fresh in the minds of many of the residents of Zamboanga, uh, of Zamboanga City. And then uh, a dozen years later, the same thing, almost identical incident happens in the city. And this cannot help the cause of the MNLF. Hmm. Stephen, do, do you want to jump in there with something? Well, the, 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 it, it's the same sort of situation because back in 2001, uh, Nur Maswari again felt he was being pushed to the margins by the then president, uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. The difference this time is that in 2001, there were no casualties, so it was possible to allow them just to walk away if they released their hostages. This time around, there will, of course, be calls for some sort of of accountability for the killings that have happened. Gentlemen, something you've both mentioned is the way the MNLF feels like it's being pushed to the margins. And I think we should probably discuss that more. And again, I'm just going to run through some stuff for the viewers. You know, we took you through the different groups a little bit earlier. But again, it's worth making these distinctions because there's been a lot of toing and froing with regards to, uh, you know, ceasefires and peace talks. So here we go again. The MNLF, this group involved in this current standoff, actually reached a peace agreement with the government back in 1996. But the country's largest rebel group, that is the MILF, Moro Islamic Liberation Front, continued with its campaign for a separate Islamic State in the South. You head on to 2001 and it too declared a ceasefire saying, yes, we're ready to hold talks with the Arroyo government. But then there was a rebel attack in Mindanao, 30 people were killed, pretty much ended any chance of peace talks there. And then it happens again, months of wrangling uh, after another ceasefire was signed in July 2003 with the MILF, but then the fighting continued by 2005. That ceasefire was history too. So we have a pattern going here. Three years later again, 2008, and they tried uh, a government deal with MILF rebels on the expansion of an autonomous Muslim region in the south, but then uh, we had objections from Christian communities. That deal then collapsed, and another 30 people were killed in renewed uh, fighting. And then just last year, the government signed a framework for a peace plan with the group hoping to end the 40-year conflict. All of that was with the MILF, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, but the leader of the M. NLF, Nur Masari, has complained his faction has been marginalized in the peace agreement. That is ostensibly what has sparked this latest standoff. So this is what I guess I've been telling us. They're feeling marginalized, pushed to the edges, I think was what Stephen said. So I'll come back to you, Stephen. If you're pushed to the edges, why not come back a little bit? Especially as you've seen the MILF has had, I was going to say they've had some success, but their ceasefires have never held. But they've probably had more success than the MNLF has. Yes, the, uh, uh, there has been a process over the last few years of reviewing the implementation of the 1996 peace agreement that you mentioned. Um, it is being hosted by the Indonesians, and there it's called the Tripartite because it's Indonesia representing the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the Philippines uh, government and the MNALF. Mm. And they were making progress on a number of points that were to be um, added to the current legal system to more fully implement that agreement. However, that progress ground to a halt beginning about 2011, 2012, uh, when the government started pushing very hard both to reform the current governmental system down there and to reach an agreement with the MILF. So as the government refused, or, excuse me, as the government focused on these new initiatives, the MNLF sort of went by the wayside. Mm. Um, and so uh, the Nurmiswari, as been pointed out by the government, Nurmiswari has in fact been going to these review meetings, uh, but he's not been satisfied with the progress of the review, mm -hmm. and now the government's attention is focused on the MILF. Zanadine, would the MNLF ideally like to be in the position that the MILF is in? Are they looking at that situa situation and saying, you know, we want what they've got, or would they be looking for something different or, or different conditions? Uh, look, both these groups, both these revolutionary movements are theoretically they're supposed to negotiate uh, for greater power, self-governance powers for the minority community here in Mindanao. Theoretically speaking, what the MNLF managed to negotiate with the 
Philippine government was a peace agreement not for the benefit of the MNLF, but theoretically for the benefit of the community to which they belong to and uh, for whose benefit they have negotiated with the government. The same thing may be said or should be said about the MLF. When they signed when the, in their negotiations with the Philippine government right now, even as they attempt to wrap up the annexes to the framework agreement which they signed last year, what they're actually doing is negotiate a power agreement that is not intended to entrench the MILF, but rather theoretically to entrench the Bank Samoros in a new power relations with the national government. The point here is this. Both revolutionary governments, when they sign a peace agreement with the national government, hmm. they should not feel or they should not be under the impression that they have proprietary or ownership rights over the peace agreement. What I mean is, if another group is able to negotiate much higher level of self-governance for, for the same community, then why should one group object to that other peace agreement? Okay. Supposedly, I mean, they should, in fact, instead of opposing each other's, uh, each other's peace agreement that they're able to negotiate with the national government, they should be, use it as a building block to build more and more and acquire more and more self Right, so on, on that note Israel. and building on that, is there any prospect of the two groups working together in some way? I know the MILF split from the MNLF many years ago, but in the end, they really want the same thing in the end. Exactly. Uh, that, that, that's the million dollar question. Uh, the OIC has... Uh, uh, tried several times to bring these two groups together uh, to come to terms and they've they've um, even created uh, a new mechanism they call the Bangsamoro Solidarity uh, Conference mm -hmm. as a sort of forum to bring these two movements together but I think what makes it makes that effort difficult is this the MNLF itself is divided into at least two groups right now so before you can even talk about unifying the agenda of both the MNLF and the MILF, then you must first talk about unifying the internal agenda mm. of the MNLF. In fact, even if you refer to this latest um, incident in Zamboanga City, latest crisis in Zamboanga City, other MNLF, MNLF units in other parts of Mindanao or even MNLF units even in Zamboanga Peninsula have said they do not entirely agree or they disagree with the latest acts of their comrades. Stephen, to continue from what zainadine has been saying, or just to get your, your thoughts on it, what is holding, what is keeping these two groups apart in the end? What is holding them back other than history from actually getting a bit of strength in numbers and trying to sort their own differences out and then going to the government together? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. One is, indeed, the organizational dynamics that uh, Zen was referring to in the sense that the MILF, as it's negotiating, has kept the negotiating process uh, w currently ongoing with the government under its control. And it w plans to keep the entire process under its basic control until 2016. So it's written into the agreements that the new government structures down there will be MILF-led, uh, while they say after 2016 it could be, as Zen says, anybody from the Philippine Muslim community, any Moro. But for the moment, it will be MILF. Mm. There are elements of the MNLF who have uh, cooperated to a greater or lesser degree with this process uh, and not objected as vociferously as Chairman Miswari. It must re be remembered, however, that as the founding chairman of the Moral National Liberation Front, as the basically father of the revolutionary separatist movement, Chairman Miswari does indeed retain a lot of residual prestige, even from people who don't agree with him, who don't agree with the tactics, who don't mm. follow his, his orders, but they respect him. And the fact that he is so upset about the current peace process is unsettling to many Muslim sectors. Do you know, gentlemen, the more we talk about this, 
the more I start to see a sort of strange comparison almost with like the Israel-Palestine situation where you've got the, the, the two Palestinian factions, Fatah and Hamas, and you've got uh, this MILF, MNLF going up against a government or going up against Israel here. The reason I draw that comparison is because, you know, the Middle East process is something that's been allowed to go on for years and years and years, and there's almost been no urgency to stop it. I wonder, and Zainadine, let me start with you, I wonder if you feel the government feels the urgency in the Philippines to do something about this because if it's been going on 40 plus years uh, there seems to be no urgency other than an acute event like this there seems to be no urgency to actually sort it out you hit the nail right when it said this conflict has seen no less than five presidents it has seen already two Aquinos as presidents hmm. um, you gotta ask yourself at, with, at what point can we finally see a conclusion to this conflict? Or even better, a, a much better question is, at what point well, you do we would, start you would think, a, Sorry to interrupt you, you would think an event like this would bring it out when you've got a, a, a city in lockdown, people being taken hostage, you would think a government would sit up and go, we've got to do something here. We've, we've, yeah, you would think, right? But we've seen this many times in the past, and we've seen much bigger incidents than this in the past. I'll give an example. From 2000 to 2008, we've seen three complex humanitarian emergencies that produced one million IDPs in 2000, half a million IDPs in 2003, and three quarters of a million in 2008. You would think that this will teach everyone a lesson, not just the national government, but it, should, it will tell everyone here, the revolutionaries, the MNLF, the MILF, mm. everyone, the majority and the minority, that it's about time to put an end to this conflict. Um, look, that, that's a tough question. We'd like to throw that question at everyone else, uh, mm. uh, both here in Mindanao and in Manila. Stephen, um, but, see, oh, but hang, on, think, hang on, let me just bring Stephen in quickly. Stephen, what do you think of that Middle East comparison that I made? I know it was a little uh, convoluted, but uh, do, you get, do you get where I'm coming from here, that there is no urgency to deal with this, even with an acute situation like this? Well, I, I've often thought that it is a good analogy in the sense that uh, Yasser Arafat was in the same uh, respected position among Palestinians, no matter whether or not you belong to his faction. Mm. Um, I do think that there is a sense of urgency in the current government. The date 2016 is when the current president steps down, and he is carrying on a family legacy of trying to reach this an agreement. Of his father back in 1981, uh, the martyr Ninoy Aquino uh, made an agreement with the Muslims. Uh, his mother back in 1986 took the unprecedented step of going to meet Nirmiswari in Nirmiswari's home province of Sulu. This current president made the unprecedented step of going to Japan to meet the head of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. He wants this thing solved on mm. his watch. He doesn't want to turn it over to the next one. Having said that, though, uh, that there is the political will on top directing that it gets solved, there are many very complex issues that have to be uh, overcome and many different actors who have to be brought along. So it's a very difficult process, and this kind of upsetting the apple cart that we're seeing down in Zamboanga City scrambles a lot of the relationships that have been built up. Right. Uh, and provide an opportunity for people to try to come up with other ways of dealing with it. If I just may, my, uh, if I might, I'll just cite some of the things that are going on in Zamboanga City right sure. now. The Catholic and Muslim clergy are coming together, issuing statements, going on TV. They will go to that stadium that you mentioned tomorrow and have an interface service. They're trying to build resilience into the community so that these kind of outside efforts don't disrupt things too badly. Uh, I heard the vice chairman of the Mindanao Business Council on uh, a newscast this evening talking about going around making sure that stores would open, uh, drug stores and grocery stores, so people could get vital supplies. Uh, the mayor reaching out to different uh, segments of the community to try to make sure that people are taken care of. The government uh, mobilizing the social work to help on the humanitarian crisis. Right. So there's lots of work being done. But the central political issues still remain. How much power, who will hold the power, what resources will they have, and what will the relationship be to the national government? Those are still being negotiated.
Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you both. I think we really got into some of the, the real details of a very acute situation going on right now. Uh, Zainadine Malang on the left of screen, Stephen Rood on the right. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, don't forget, you can find this story and many others at AlJazeera.com. Just follow the links for the shows. And of course, look for Inside Story. I'm Kamal Santamaria from The Whole Team. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.